Please remain standing, and if you will, um, if you'll pull the Bible out from the pew rack in front of you, you can find our scripture reading there in the New Testament on page 32 and 33. And if you will, remain standing as we read this lesson from the Gospel. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Listen now for the word of the Lord. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. And now, if you will, bow with me as we pray together. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If I didn't know any better, I would think that with all this talk of road construction in the scriptures for today, both Isaiah's proclamation and John's repeating Isaiah, that perhaps they had been driving around Amarillo in the last year or two. I mean, we've been through it. We've been through this road construction. It's a, it's a messy thing, and I'm certain that you have probably run into those orange cones. Well, well, maybe you didn't run into them, but, you know, as you were driving, you saw them, and they steered you off in a different way. Or maybe you nearly got run into by someone who failed to pay attention to a detour sign, or perhaps you were headed in your normal direction, and uh, you saw a sign that said, this road's going to be closed for six weeks or six months or six years. I don't know. Um, there's just a lot of highway construction going on. And, th and that's really what Isaiah is talking about. But he's talking about it, of course, in a spiritual way, a way that says to us that God wants so much to be with you. He wants the road to be straight. No mountains, no valleys, just a straight shot. Pretty much like it is from here to Plainview, you know? Straight shot, not too many curves. That's what the proclamation is for today. Prepare the way of the Lord. And you know, when I read this text from Mark, it just doesn't sound very Christmassy, you know? It's the first chapter and the first verse. No angels, no shepherds, no wise men, no stars doesn't sound very Christmassy to me, but Mark's gospel starts chapter 1, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And it begins where maybe a lot of us are right now. It begins in the wilderness. And the proclamation today is to make the way straight. Make a road, build a road that the Messiah can travel on. Build a road on which the Messiah who comes to save us, can make his way to us and us to him. If this scripture tells us anything, if all of scripture tells us anything, it tells us that more than anything, God wants to be where we are. God wants to be with us. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. And so this road construction is an important thing. We're beginning this series called On the Roads to Bethlehem. And I want to ask you that question today. What road are you traveling? And where are you going? Where do you want to be when Christmas rolls around, when we celebrate the birth of Christ? I'm guessing that you, like many people I know, want to be in a place where you're loved and accepted for who you are. You want to be in a place where people care truly and deeply for you. 
You want to be in a place where life is just and fair and you're not taken advantage of. You want to be in a place where your weaknesses aren't abused and where your strengths are celebrated. You want to be in a place where all those abilities you have, those gifts that you want to share, can be shared generously. And you can find joy in the sharing and the people who receive them can be blessed. You want to be in a place where God reigns, where God is in charge, where God is worshipped and honored and where we allow God to live in our hearts and where we make place for God in our world. Don't we all want something like that? Well, Isaiah begins his whole book with a warning. We read from chapter 40, but Isaiah starts in chapter 1, and all of those 39 chapters are basically a warning. He warns us that we can't put our wants above anyone else's. We can't deny life and hope to other people. While we push and shove and grab what we want, you see, the reason that Isaiah chapter 40 is a chapter of good news is because the whole most of the 39 chapters up to this point recount how God's people had so wanted the good life for themselves that they had neglected and refused to share it with others. Their worship of God had been half-hearted or non-existence or they had worshipped the idols of their culture. Their worship or lack of it had not produced the compassion of Christ, but had created indifference to the people that were around them. And so the people of Israel found themselves in exile. Exile because they had separated themselves from God and because they had trusted in their own devices, their own wealth, their own power, anything they could do to get what they wanted. The very first chapter of Isaiah puts it this way as Isaiah challenges the people to return to faith and to avoid the calamity ahead. It's a detour sign in bold letters. He says, speaking for God, I've had enough sacrifices and offerings, enough solemn assemblies and festivals. Wash yourselves, make yourself clean, cease to do evil, learn to do good, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And then again, speaking as God's voice, he says, come now, let us argue it out. I just love that. God wants to argue with you about what needs to happen. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet they shall be like snow. So to shorten the story, we hear for these 39 chapters that God has grown weary of his people putting obstacles on the path that others need to travel to get to God. And God will not allow the sin of injustice and oppression to continue. But what God does allow is that he allows the powers of this world to do what they will and Israel is taken away into exile. And chapter 40 proclaims good news that the exile is over and the people of God will be redeemed. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very Christmassy to me. Warnings at Christmas time are not what we're used to, but that's the backstory. That's the backstory for Isaiah, and it's the backstory for John the Baptist wandering in the wilderness and quoting Isaiah to his followers. Just as Isaiah told Israel, John reminds us that our sin is the big, biggest obstacle we face when we're in the business of building roads for God to travel on. Nowadays, we're a little reluctant to talk that much about sin especially at Christmas time, especially in church at Christmas time. We want happy stuff. We want the fun stuff, the joyful stuff. And I understand that. I want that too. I don't really want to spend much time contemplating my sin and where I have fallen short. 
And yet the scripture is pretty clear. If we don't address our sins, we don't have much chance of encountering the Messiah, the Christ child. And so let's think about this for just a minute. Condemning other people for their sins while maintaining your own righteousness is a caricature. The Saturday Night Live church lady caricature. And that's not what Isaiah and John are saying. And it's a misrepresentation of what Jesus said and did. You know, we've talked about these things before, this notion of repentance. Repentance simply means turn around. Turn around, go a different direction. It's a big sign that says you're going the wrong way. And sin, sin is that thing that we're doing that is going the wrong way. Sin in Greek, that word means missing the mark. You're not being the person that God created you to be. Go a different direction. It's important for us to hear that. Because basically Isaiah and John and Jesus are simply saying, if you want to know the love of God, if you want to get to your life's destination, if you want to find the kingdom of heaven, turn around. You're going the wrong direction. You're going opposite from the way God's coming at you and you're heading in the opposite direction. We walk away from God whenever we choose not to love our neighbor. We walk away from God whenever we don't love ourselves. We walk away from God whenever we don't put God first in our lives, in our work, in our pleasure. We have an incredible ability to turn and walk away even while God is trying to get to us as fast as he can. Our failures, our sins, our decisions to go the wrong direction cause us to find ourselves separated from God and from other people and from ourselves. The consequences of our insistence on going our own way ripple through our lives and when they do, we find fear and frustration and anxiety and worry and despair and uncertainty. And we don't know what we should do or how we should go or where we are going. But the good news of Christmas and the good news of Christ is that there is a way, that God has made a way through Jesus Christ to experience God's love and God's peace and God's joy. When we say that God is incarnate in Jesus Christ, when we say the Word has become flesh, when we say Jesus is both human and divine, we are saying that we can know God. That we can live as we are created to be in union with God. And the gift of Christmas is that that union is promised to us. And that we can find it as we follow the path that Christ sets before us. Jesus Christ was born and lived and died and was raised from the dead for us. So that we can know that union with God. It's important that we as Christians understand that committing ourselves to following that path, it's a, it's a way of God finding us and of us finding God. And once we have committed ourselves to that path that leads to a life with Christ, the work and the journey don't stop there. You see, the work of the church and of every Christian is to make it easier for people to come to God. That's what we're supposed to do. Make those mountains lower and lift up those valleys and make the way straight. And Polk Street is really working hard at doing some of that kind of road construction. As we think about leveling out the landscape, it's important for us to share the good news of Christ. Good news that said, you are, says you are made by God, you are loved by God, and you are claimed by Christ. And I am willing to walk with you on this part of the journey. Now today, as we think about this road to Bethlehem, we are focusing on an understanding of hope, of bringing Christ's hope 
into the world in big and small ways. And I think one of the greatest hopes we have in this life is that we don't have to live and die all alone. That we will have people on the journey with us. There are, for some folks, this year there is a new sense of dread as they have a grief. Someone that they love has died and this is the first time that they will gather for Christmas and there will be an empty chair at the table and that absence will be felt in very strong ways. And so trying to cheer them up or make them forget about their loved one isn't the way to bring hope into their lives because the last thing people want to do is to forget that person that they loved that is no longer with us on this earth. And grief has a way of unfolding on its own. We don't know when grief is going to hit us or how. And so trying to cheer them up may or may not be helpful. It may be the thing they need and it may not. We have to offer those who are grieving during this time space, an opportunity to remember, to reflect, and to share stories of the person who they loved who is no longer with us. That's a gift. It's a great Christmas gift to give because it is a way of helping level out that valley of grief for those who are on that part of the journey. And this afternoon at 3 o'clock in our sanctuary, Kevin will be leading a worship service for those who need that experience of being in God's presence and knowing that their loved one is with God. A way of experiencing the hope of Christ, even in the midst of sadness. Now my hope for all of you is that you know and that you're clear that you do not journey on this path alone. And as you navigate that way for Christmas, if you come across an obstacle you need help with, we hope, Kevin and Bert and Margie and I, we hope you'll give us a call and come in or we'll come and visit with you so that we can help journey with you in that difficult time when you feel like you are alone. As we think a bit more about removing obstacles and making it easier for people to come to God, let's think about how we interact with those who are in need. You know, I don't know when you've last experienced, but that sense when you needed something that you couldn't do for yourself, you needed someone else to help you along the way. Consider that human hope that we have that we can live in a community where people will care for us and see our needs. And one of the things that's probably not very helpful is telling people that they need to just pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. First of all, I didn't do well in my in my high school physics class, but I know that physics says that you cannot pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And you really can't do it if you don't have any boots with any straps to pull yourself up. Well, we're reaching out to children who need shoes. Kevin's already talked about it and the shoe trees out in the foyer. If you want to buy a pair of shoes for a kid who needs just that one more thing to help them feel proud and comfortable and at ease as they go through their daily living. It's a simple thing, it's a small thing, but it's a way of giving hope. We all need to know that there are people out there that are going to help us, big and small, needs that we have that need to be fulfilled in some way or another because we can't do it all by ourselves. Polk Street is helping make that hope for community a reality in the lives of children in so many different ways. Now, another hope that we have, another thing that we can talk about as a roadblock, a roadblock that we're working to remove, that can prevent any of us from living the abundant life that Christ promises, is when we are simply suffering through a, a chronic illness or just an everyday illness, and there's nowhere to turn for help. You know, if we let those people just continue to suffer, it's like we're driving along on the highway and there's a 
car with a hood raised on the side and we just keep on going and don't stop and help. But Polk Street has decided we're going to stop and help and we're working with Heal the City to help those folks who need to just have that gift of health so that they can have hope for tomorrow and tomorrow and for the future. And Heal the City, those volunteers are going to be here this evening in our church. And we give thanks for that ministry and the way in which it offers hope to the world. Hope of a full and abundant life. That's what Jesus offered to us. And Heal the City is offering physical and spiritual hope to people so that they can journey on the highway and they can find God. We know that road construction is a messy business. It's hard work. And we're going to have to keep at it. We have to look inward in our own life and we have to look outward at those roadblocks that are keeping people from encountering God. And so as I close today and as we prepare our hearts for communion, I invite you to meditate on the road that you're working on in your own life. Remember that the good news is that all of us are created to be in union with God. And so communion is an excellent way to experience the mystery, the power, the presence of God. As you come, I encourage you to come with your heart and to just open your hands. And as you put your hands out to receive the bread, ask for what you need. God will help you find a way and will provide for you. As you come, I invite you to confess where you are. Maybe there's a roadblock that you need for God to move out of the way. Or maybe you've been a roadblock for somebody else and God needs to move you out of the way. But just make your confession as you sit and as you sing and pray. I invite you to be in a time of confession. And maybe you're not interested in praying right now. Maybe you need to experience some joy and to encounter the mystery of God. And so we'll be singing some hymns. And all of those hymns have as a part of the words that are printed there the mystery of how Christ is divine and human, the Word made flesh. So maybe you want to meditate on those words as you sing. If you don't feel like singing or praying or confessing, then maybe you might feel like blessing people. And so as people leave at the ends of the rail, as every person leaves, just look at that person. Don't stare at them because nobody likes to be stared at when they're coming back from communion. Just look at them and offer a blessing. God bless that person. God bless that person. And maybe if you know a special need in that person's life, Pray for that person and the need that is before them. And lastly, I'd encourage you, I'm giving you lots of options here, to think about a path that you need to create. Maybe God's calling you to do something new in your life, something different. Open yourself in this communion to receive some wisdom and guidance about that direction and how you can create that path. So as we celebrate Holy Communion, I invite you during this Christmas season to pray and to work as hard as you can to remove every obstacle that blocks the path of God's grace. And I invite you to hear once again the call of the prophet to prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the path. For God is coming. Christ is coming. Make that way straight so that God can get here as quickly as he can. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.